Zdravo nasite, hello to everyone. I'm Meto Koloski, President of the United Macedonian Diaspora. Happy St. George's Day to those celebrating today, and I hope everyone is staying safe and healthy. Please feel free to take to social media with the hashtags Mario's History Talks and at UM Diaspora and at Gen Macedonia to share about tonight's event. Everyone on the virtual hour has been muted. If you have any questions, please feel free to write them in the chat and Mario will try to answer as many as possible following his presentation. Last month, we hosted four top-notch educational UMD virtual hours with Mario Kristovski of the popular YouTube series, Mario's History Talks. Since this past Monday, marked 117th, 117th since, uh, year anniversary since the death of Macedonian independence fighter Gotze Dilcik, we invited Mario back to do a bonus talk on why Gotze Dilcik matters. Before we get to tonight's presentation, few points. Uh, yesterday marked Macedonian Language Day and the 75th anniversary of the modern day Macedonian alphabet. To mark the occasion, we published a UMD Voice article by past Generation M board member Alec Vasilevsky on Macedonia and the EU and uh, uh, assessing Bulgaria's language demands. And you can read that article on generationm.org. As you may know, Bulgaria has demanded Macedonian, Macedonia change its history and textbooks, agree to a fabricated Bulgarian identity, and uh, also uh, kind of change freedom fighters like Gotze Dilcev, Yanis Sandanski, their identity, and agreeing that Macedonian is a Western Bulgarian dialect with Serbanized words. Those are not my words, ladies and gentlemen. Those are the words of the Bulgarian Foreign Minister Ekaterina Zaharieva last weekend in a televised interview. Later in the day, we were deeply disappointed and surprised by a xenophobic and racist attack upon UMD by Bulgarian member of the European Parliament, Andrei Kovacev, on his Facebook verified page. He featured the video link of last week's talk we did with Mario on the very important topic of Wikipedia warriors, the new front lines in the Battle of Macedonia. Kovacev called UMD anti-Bulgarian. While a formal statement was issued by UMD today, let me remind him and the members of our audience that UMD is not xenophobic, it's not racist, nor anti-Bulgarian. We are uh, anti-Bulgarian government policy of discrimination, human rights violations, and historical revisionism against the Macedonians and the Macedonian minority living in Bulgaria. Mario, um, I think with, with this you have uh, really touched a nerve apparently with your Wikipedia presentation as someone who is accustomed uh, to being attacked by Bulgarian prime ministers and foreign ministers in the past. My advice to you is don't stop. Keep doing what you are doing. Uh, with that, thank you to our attendees um, for tonight. Let me turn it over to Mario. All right, thank you for that, Mito. Great to see everybody here tonight. Um, some returning faces, some new faces as well. Might get tired of me saying this, but if we don't know each other already, let's change that. Definitely send me a message. And um, I'll pretend that it's uh, my engaging talks and not the boredom from coronavirus as to why you're all attending. I must have been engaging enough. After all, as Mito said, the Bulgarian member of parliament did also share the video. So uh, with that, I am very encouraged by what I'm seeing and uh, definitely motivated to keep producing videos like this and keep engaging the Macedonian community at large. So before you get started, I'm going to tell you what we're talking about tonight and what we're not talking about. As always, Mario's rules for interpreting anything within history. So first, we are going to be talking about Gotze Delchev. Now, for those of you that did attend my previous uh, history talks, especially the first one, I've already given you a lot of good resources on Gotze Delchev's life, his biography, and all the important pieces you need to know. 
I'm going to give you a very brief overview on Gotsudo Chip's life. We're not going to get into too much detail like we did with Yana Sabansky. Not that it's not worth our time, but as the title suggests, I want to talk about why Gotze Delchev matters, why he is so important. Why is there a picture of him in church halls? Why is there a picture of him in schools? All the folk songs, the movies. And if you don't have a picture of him somewhere in your house, I'd be pretty surprised. I kid, of course. So we're going to be talking about why he matters, a brief biographic, uh, biographical overview. And after that, we're going to talk about his impact. And uh, keep in mind, like I said, we are discussing a real person that we may idealize, but a real person nonetheless with very human faults and limitations. We may look up to Gutsu. He may be one of the giants in our history, but he was a man nonetheless. And as I said before, never have heroes that are not fictional. Only have fictional heroes. That's the way you should interpret history. That's the way you should interpret anything you're studying from the past that involves real people. So with that, folks, I do want to get started now. Uh, we're going to open up the floor to some questions and answers uh, towards the end. So if you do have anything that catches your eye as I'm speaking, do make a note of it. We'll definitely get to it. We'll make a good time, so no worries there. And uh, for all those that saw the tech problems I had last time, no worries. Uh, we're insulated there as well. So let's get started. So first, I do want to talk about basic facts about Gotze Dolce. We're already going to get into his biography, but... This man lived for 31 years. And you know how long he worked for the Macedonian cause? 10 years. He worked for the Macedonian cause for 10 years. And in that short time period, he established himself as a giant in our history. This young, young teacher. What did he do in those 10 years? What, did he, what was his legacy after the fact that made him such a giant in our history? Well, that's what we're gonna to discover tonight. So let's get started. And per my introduction, you are watching Mario's History Talks and let's get started now. So with Gutsu Delchev, um, basics, he was born in February of 1872, February 4th, in Aegean Macedonia, a village called Kukush. Now, again, I'm not gonna get into the details of it. There's a lot of interesting stuff there. Kukush has a very rich, and uh, important part in the Macedonian cultural traditions. They were the vanguard in the Macedonian revolutionary movement. They were on the vanguard against the Greek churches that were attempting to make the Macedonians into Greeks themselves. You have to remember, despite what the um, connotation is today, the Macedonians are anything but Macedonians, this wasn't the view back then. Back then, the view was amongst the Greek uh, clergy and the state government that we were the Macedonians from Alexander the Great, from Philip, but we were in fact Greeks who simply forgot our identity. So the uh, MO of the Greek state back then was to forcibly re-Hellenize, make the Macedonians Greeks again, and Kukush was caught in the middle of this. So as you can imagine, Gotze was raised in a very revolutionary milieu from his very first steps. Well, he was from a well-to-do family in Kukush. Uh, they were an innkeeper. And basically, um, seeing all this in, around him, I mean, from his very early um, steps, he was already influenced by all the rev revolutionary movements that were happening all around Macedonia. It seemed as if Macedonia was left behind. So Glitza does, does grow up there. And eventually, uh, despite his father's wishes, his father did want him to remain and become a craftsman, he was sent to the uh, men's high school in Salonika, the St. Cyril and Methodius Men's High School. And uh, apparently his mother's last words for him were, go, go son, go to Solon and come back and free Macedonia. So quite a big deal back then to be able to go to a school. You have to remember Macedonia did not have any higher education institutions back then. What it did have, it was small in quantity, and it was all, mostly all, by the Bulgarian church. These schools were in a way to Bulgarianize the Slavic Macedonian population of Macedonia to have a Bulgarian national identity. So Gotze does go there, and he does excel as a student. He's a very strong student overall, but he's also a bit of a troublemaker. 
on the um, occasion of the Pashas of, the, of Solon, the, you can think of him as like the mayor, all the school students were uh, lined up in the schoolyard and they were supposed to sing songs to him. Now Gotze uh, was, amongst other students, uh, forced to speak in Turkish. He did speak Turkish very well. He was supposed to say, long live the Sultan. But he actually ended up saying also in Turkish, down with the Sultan. In Turkish, these two sentences actually sound remarkably similar. And he shouted this in front of everybody there. Luckily, he did not get in trouble. But what you're seeing is, even from his early days in high school, as an immature teenager, he already had a revolutionary mindset about what was to happen with the Macedonians. And as he very poignantly stated, he had no issue with the Turkish in Macedonia. It was against the Ottoman system purely. No racial hatred against any ethnic group, just the systems. So, of course, after that, with opportunities being limited in Macedonia, Gotze does graduate from the men's high school in Solon, and he's given a choice, basically, whether he wants to become a teacher, which is pretty much what was the expected course uh, graduating from the high school, but he was also given the opportunity to study in the uh, military academy in Sofia, Bulgaria. And while he's there, obviously this, again, this was all the Macedonians had. This was prestigious. To have a military background is, I mean, it was as prestigious as it was today. Many Macedonians were not only living in Sofia at the time, but it was almost overrun by Macedonians. Gotze was not the first nor the last that was able to go there and use the resources available. And you fast forward to 2020, it's like we're doing the same thing, you know, taking out Bulgarian passports and going to Bulgaria for, you know, entry into the EU. Not much different. It was a desperate situation. I'm not going to belabor the point, but he did what was, he um, seized what was available to him. Now, while there, and this is the point that uh, Bulgarian historians love to point out, he was in a Bulgarian military institution. However, he was eventually expelled. Despite being an average uh, military cadet, he was expelled because of the left-leaning and revolutionary circles he not only associated himself with, but was publishing. He was the one that was bringing in literature, revolutionary pamphlets. He was already making revolutionaries of people that he would go on to fight with in the future. Of course, this caught the noses of the Bulgarian authorities there, and he was expelled. And we have to understand this, um, while the view was Macedonians and Bulgarians were one people back then, there was a lot of concern from the Bulgarians that these, you know, crazy, you know, Westerners, as they called them, were beginning to become separatist and autonomous, that they wanted to do things their own way, not through mother Bulgaria, by themselves, regional. And Gotze did obviously catch the eye of the authorities with some of the ideas he was pushing forward. So he does eventually uh, become expelled. And by this point, he is, he, he dreaded the day he ever left Macedonia. He does eventually find uh, salvation. He does return to Macedonia as a school teacher in Shtip. And uh, he becomes a teacher in 1894. And while in Shtip, he does meet this other Macedonian, you may have heard of him, by the name of Dame Gruev. Now, Dame Gruev at this point was already a member of the Central Committee of the Macedonian Revolutionary Org. And of course, this was a meeting aligned in the stars. Immediately, Gotze is moved with this idea and becomes a member. And uh, while there, obviously, he is not only a teacher, but a revolutionary at, at, at heart. He is not only instilling a revolutionary fever into the populace, he's teaching them, he's educating them, he's giving night courses to adults that are not literate. Um, and he is involving himself in the organization. His youthful and almost infectious love of Macedonia is very clearly seen from the get-go. So he does start making his ranks there. From Shtip, obviously, he does become, he transferred to Pirinska Macedonia in Bansko, where he's also a teacher there. And he's there with the committee through the highs and lows of their existence. We're not going to get into them, but needless to say, it was a tumultuous period from kidnappings to whole um, expositions of the underground tunnels of the committee members to financing to getting weapons to making bombs he was in the middle of all this and uh finally he does go there and um after that however he is assigned along with george petrov to be the external representative of the mastering cause in bulgaria while in bulgaria he is basically the diplomat with 
Yorche for the Macedonian Revolutionary Movement. And he is constantly butting heads with the pro-Bulgarian -le pro leaning Supreme Macedonian Committee, which as you remember from my previous video, essentially wanted to make the whole Macedonian movement come under the wing of Bulgaria to not only unify Macedonia to Bulgaria, but involve Bulgarian officers, Bulgarian money, and Bulgarian government at every step of the way. And Gotze was the vanguard against that. So he is pushing back against that. And we're gonna get into that, of course. And finally, towards the end, towards the beginning of the 1900s, the ill-fated idea of a Macedonian revolution does come about. Gotze is adamantly against this, along with other people. He says Macedonians are not ready yet. We're gonna get into the reasons why. Of course, it does still proceed. And while they are in preparation for it, in the spring of 1903, while traveling AG in Macedonia, Gotze, while passing, going on his way to Ser, is staying locally in the village of Banitsa, where, as we all know, he is betrayed and he is killed. Now, not many of us know what actually happened then. I'm actually gonna get into a little bit of a biographical feature here, exactly what happened. Basically, Gotze does arrive at the village late at night and he's with about 14 militia members. And uh, we know this from the sources of the people that did survive. Um, Gotze was up until 3.30, 4 o'clock in the morning speaking with other committee members in the house, the local Trendafilov family that they were uh, using as lodging. And they're looking up the stars. They're actually talking about the attacks of the Solon Gemiji, which, per my previous video, you should have watched their uh, movie that came out in 1961. So he's talking about the attacks and they're just kidding around saying we can't even tell night from day anymore because we're always up we're always busy and we're always working so they smoke a little tobacco and eventually they go to bed for about a couple hours and with the very few hours of sleep they get they are alerted by a gunshot Gotze is awakened they tell him that looks like there's turks coming in the village Gotze dismisses this he says oh it's probably just a shepherd trying to get his uh, sheep in one place but eventually they hear more shots they're awakened Again, they're told he's been betrayed. The Ottomans are here. One of the committee members goes on top of the roof of the family where they're staying, and they see the Ottomans envelop the whole village. They take out all the villagers, put them in the village square, and they start torturing them. They start lighting the village on fire. They take the village priest, start beating him up. They start um, interrogating his son. They kill him. They kill the priest's son. Gotze is seeing all this. All the people... He wanted to give his life for and liberate. He's seeing them mowed down. He's seeing the entire village destroyed. And despite what he knows from the committee uh, constitution, that he's not supposed to expose himself if he can avoid it. He could have stayed put the whole time. He knew he couldn't. The entire village was at stake. So he does exit. He exits and he makes his way through the village to the outskirts. And while there, he is um, at this unfinished barn with a hill sloping up to a wall. And he goes there. And uh, he sees children, little villagers, coming down from the hill, crying. And he tells them, are there any Turks up there? They don't respond. They're crying. They don't know. They can't speak even. So Gotze goes up there. And once he goes up there, like I said, there's a wall, a bristling hedgehog, hedgehog of pines from the bayonets of the Ottoman soldiers are there exposing themselves. He's been betrayed, and now the Ottomans are engaging him. And while this is happening, Gotze, everybody is, you know, fronting the Ottoman Empire. Gotze is calmly reloading his rifle. And as he's reloading his rifle, he is shot in the heart and he dies. That was his first and last engagement in shooting. He never shot a rifle officially before that. So let's take a look really quickly at some of the last moments of Dilch's life. And I'm just going to tell you a little bit about what exactly happened. So this is um, one of his associates talking about Gotze's last words and how he remembered this uh, Macedonian giant, his last couple of moments on earth. As we walked, Gotze looked at me. This is when they're going up the hill. But more proudly than I've ever seen him look in my life, with his cloak flung over his left shoulder, his white fez, it's a hat, wrapped in a bluish scarf, pulled down, his gun slung across his left elbow, he said, what, Chakov? Go on. And whatever God wills, wills. And he went up the hill, and that's what happened to Gotze Dolchev. He is killed immediately thereafter. 
Now the rest of the committee, they're there for about 14 hours. They're engaging the Turks. They take the dead Gotsadochev into a barn and they fight and uh, hold the body there, engaging them. And the Turks don't actually, um, don't actually defeat them. They're left alone finally. And one of his comrades there, a man by the name of Dimo Haji Dimov, along with Chakov from the previous um, conversation, this is what they said. This is Dimo talking. They're in the castle for 15 hours. And this is what Dimo says. For 15 hours, the Turks did not dare approach our dead. For 15 hours, we looked upon the dead Gotze, lying as though bent over the grave of Macedonia. For 15 hours, our hearts bled. Then and there, they knew they were looking at the death of Macedonia. They were at the grave of Macedonia instantly with his death. So what happens afterwards? We're gonna fast forward a little here. Well. Gotze um, is ordered to be sent to Sidis initially, um, but that order is um, delayed. And another order comes through where he's allowed to be buried in Banitsa at the local church there. And early on, I'm going to tell you, Gotze was not all that significant as we hold him today up until around World War I. But even then, we do see the early signs that he was already becoming a mythical figure, even if not to the level we have him today. So what happens? Well, after the Balkan Wars, the Greek army, while going through Kukush, where he was born, they destroy it and burn it to the ground. The entire inhabitants are forced to, are forced to be expelled and they're taken to Bulgaria. His whole birthplace is destroyed. So there's no monument to him. As for the Bulgarians, the ones in the Supreme Committee there, uh, the ones that you know, consider the Macedonians to be troublesome, um, one of them, a couple members, uh, their quota is saying, at least we're free of that dog now. And these are the people that are claiming he's now their national hero. At least we're free of that dog. But let's take a look at other sources. We also have the Turkish reaction. You have to remember, Gotze was a cosmopolitan. He did not distinguish between different races. He saw people, all people were equal. And because of his uh, left-leaning ideas, he did earn the respect of a lot of Ottomans, a lot of Turks that were also fighting for the liberalization and modernization of the Ottoman Empire. And in fact, when one of his brothers, Christo, was to be married after Gotze's death, many of the guests to the Dilchev household were Turks. Not only did they come bearing, bearing gifts, not only did they come and dance and feast, they were doing it to honor Gotze. They respected him as well, even that early on. They knew a Macedonian giant was lost. And even then you see Yanis Andansky, who together with the Turks, not only did he work with them, he marched with them in Istanbul to liberalize and reform the Ottoman Empire. The seed of friendship between Macedonians and Turks arguably started with Gotze's outlook in the world. So pretty remarkable. But let's take a look at what uh, outside sources also said. This is from the Times of London. I'm just gonna quote you some stuff I found. Gotze was a true leader of the well-known internal organization and the mainspring of the entire Macedonian movement. The journalist and publicist John McDonald, he wrote in the Daily News that Dilchev was for many years the spirit of the revolution in Macedonia, the idol of tens of thousands of villagers in Macedonia. Now, many of us know the songs about, um, there's a very famous song about a little girl being tied up by the Ottomans, being interrogated to disclose where Gotze was hiding. And in the song, according to legend, she said, you can kill me. I can be lost to the ages. I'm never going to tell you where Gotze is hiding. You have to understand back then, when villagers knew that Gotze Loche was coming through their town, they were preparing months in advance. They were making the food already. They were preparing their houses. They were preparing the supplies. For Gotze Loche to come through your village, not only was it a great honor, you were seeing the lifeblood, the spirit of the Macedonian Revolution. And you would only grow bigger from there. So they were preparing months from his arrival. And other sources obviously saw him the exact same way. They saw him as the chief of the Macedonian revolution, the, the spirit, mm -hmm. the evil leader, so innocently, but so evilly, I mean, just taken way before his time. So that's the international reaction. As we're seeing, he's already starting to become a myth, even if it's not the level that we're seeing today. So let's take a look at why this is the case and why I'm gonna argue with Gotze's death, he becomes bigger and bigger because his legacy, his lessons, and his sacrifice become the sustaining force 
for the emancipation of the Macedonian people, both physical, but also mental. And that's what Gotze represents. So let's take a look. Macedonia is divided. As you know from my previous talks, the Macedonian revolutionary organization is split after the failure of Ilinden. There's now competing factions. There's a right, uh, right wing uh, pro Bulgaria leaning Macedonian revolutionary org, and there's a faction of more left leaning. Those are a little bit closer to Delchev ideologically on the left side of the spectrum as well. However, um, by the early 20s, 1924, they do try to unite once more. They do try to come together to forge not only the union again, but to compromise, to actually liberate Macedonia, which is now divided. And many of Goetz's comrades, many of Goetz's friends and revolutionaries, including Dimo Haji Dimov, who was there with them, were instrumental in this. What happened? They created what's called the May Manifesto. And this is one of the first inklings from Vomoro of a distinct Macedonian people, identity, and movement completely clear from any Bulgarian intrusion. And this was in many respects made because of Dilchev's legacy, because of his views. Both left and right got together to ink this out. And this is actually how it starts out. To the Macedonian people, to the organized revolutionary population in Macedonia, and to the Macedonian revolutionaries, our Macedonian brothers. Now you can look at the main manifesto online for yourself. It's actually a very important piece to our history. It's almost like an early declaration of independence. Not only states that Macedonia is to be independent, but Macedonians are not Greeks, they're not Bulgarians, and they're not Serbians. And these are the very same people that were fighting with Gotze, continuing his legacy. Now, of course, this does fail at the end of the day. There is Bulgarian interference in this. In fact, the Bulgarian side forces the more right-leaning Macedonians to renounce the document completely. So it does fall to shambles. But in its place, another Vamoto comes about, which many of you may not know about. This is the Vamoto United. This is the left-leaning Vamoto. Now, I'm not going to get into too much discussions on politics, but for all intents and purposes, these men, like Peter Poparsov and Dimo Haji Dimov and Dmitry Vlahov, they were ideologically closest to Gotze Dilchev. These were the men that, like I said, Vamoto was a spectrum. There were right-leaning and left-leaning people. There was no clear direction. This side of it was almost universally left-leaning. They wanted autonomy for Macedonia and an eventual state for Macedonia as part of a wider Balkan federation. And this is what Vamoto, I, I should say, united, actually accomplished. They got the Macedonian people recognized by the Comintern, the communists, in the early 30s. This is the first official, I'm saying official, recognition of the Macedonian people by a political recognized institution. That was massive. Not only this, but they're working AG in Macedonia to get Macedonian literacy and culture back in its roots. They even said in a newspaper in Greece, we Macedonians also insist on not being called Bulgarians, for we are neither Bulgarians, nor Serbs, nor Greeks, but Macedonians. So again, the people that Gotze inspired most directly, they're the ones that have the most tangible impact on the not, not only the emancipation of the Macedonian people, but our recognition, putting our ideals for the world. Gotze very famously stated, as he was a school teacher, he said, I know you all speak Macedonian, but I'm going to teach you to speak French, because French is the language of the world, of politics, of diplomacy. And you're going to be able to tell the world you are Macedonians. And that's what his students did. I'm saying students literally and figuratively, but that's what they did. They not only took that idea, they revealed it to the world. They made it loud. They made it heard. They made us recognized. So let's keep going now. During the Greek Civil War, we're fast forwarding a little bit here. We know what happens. Terror, absolute terror on the native Macedonian population. Tongues being cut out. People raped, murdered, expelled. Absolutely no hope for Macedonian identity, so it seems. And this is from a book called uh, Macedonia Contested Identity by Loring Danforth. Highly recommend you check this book out. I want to share with you a little excerpt about what happens, um, what actually happened in the uh, Greek Civil War and its aftermath. So this is a man named Angelo remembering his dedo, his grandfather, telling him about his memories in the Greek Civil War. He said, you're my only son, but you must die for your mother tongue, Macedonian, for Macedonia. 
And uh, he said, later during the Greek Civil War, the Greek soldiers stationed in Nelkazi made the children march around the village singing a little song in Greek. This is the song. I am Greek, a Macedonian. That is my pride and my honor. I say it with joy so that it will reach the heavens. Key here. But as soon as the soldiers turned their backs, the school children began singing another song. Song in pure Macedonian they had learned from several generations earlier that belonged to Gotsadochev. And this is their song. The flag of Gotsadochev still waves in the struggle for Macedonia. Imagine this. We have little school children literally being told if they speak Macedonian, they could be killed. They could have their tongues cut off. They could have their parents killed. There were police listening to the walls through doors to make sure nobody was speaking anything but Greek. And these little school children with their memory of Gota Dolchev, after being forced to sing this disgusting Greek propaganda song, in their face, they sang, the flag of Gota Dolchev waves in the struggle for Macedonia. Absolutely incredible. That is what Gota Dolchev represented for not only the youth, but for his people. And we see this. We see this unbroken continuity up until the present day. What do we have in World War II? Well, Macedonia is occupied by the Bulgarian fascists. It's brutal. The Nazis themselves are scared by the level of atrocities from the Bulgarians. My own ancestors said in their own accounts, they preferred the Germans to the Bulgarians in terms of the occupation because the Germans at least had some discipline, some hierarchy, some authority, not the case with the Bulgarian army. It was absolutely miserable. And what happens? The first Macedonian detachments that are starting to form for the liberation of Macedonia against the uh, Bulgarian fascist occupier, guess whose name they take? In September of 1942, the Gotsa attachment of partisans is formed in none other than Bitola. In 1944, another brigade of the same name comes into being. They're flying flags with Gotsa Dolce's name and his little face as part of their struggle for a liberated Macedonia and for their own salvation as Macedonians. So let's just take a look here really quickly. I know we've had problems with screen sharing, but um, no worries. Uh, it's just gonna be quick here. There we go. This is liberated Macedonia. This is uh, marching through Skopje. These are our partisans. These are our eunuchs. Guess whose name it's there? Gotsadelchev, right there, clear as can be. This is Macedonian, Gotsadelchev. So with that, like I said, there's an unbroken, arguably, continuity in Gotsadelchev's memory as a sustaining force for the Macedonian people throughout the whole wretched experience they would encounter after his death. He never stopped being their guiding principle. And we see this. When the first Macedonian state is resurrected, finally comes into being with all the bloodshed, toil, misery after World War II, the first meeting of Asnum, the anti-fascist uh, parliament of the National Liberation of Macedonia, they have an official opening speech. A man by the name of Panko Brashnov is tasked with giving the opening um, dialogue, the opening speech to convene the meeting. Among other people he salutes, he salutes Roosevelt, he salutes Tito. He salutes the partisans. And the last person he salutes, Gotseta Delchev. No chance that his memory would be eradicated. To these men, the very fact that they were on the cusp of forming the first ever, or I shouldn't say the first modern Macedonian state for the Macedonian people with their own Macedonian language, finally free from foreign intrusion, they knew this was Gotseta Delchev's legacy. They knew this, and they saw this as the final realization of that struggle. So pretty remarkable. And his legacy, like I said, arguably continues to grow day by day. So let's take a look at now exactly what was in his ideals. What were his morals? What was his outlook that made him so infectious, such a driving force for the mastering people? Why, why was it Gotze? There were revolutionaries similar to him, similar outlooks. There were revolutionaries that came much before him. There were revolutionaries that died of old age. There were ones that died younger than he did. 
why was Gota Dilchev the one that stuck out? Well, this is a little bit of a Mario kind of hypothesis. I'm going to give you a couple of things I've noticed that definitely set Gota apart. And we're going to get into the nitty gritty after my talk. Number one, Gota was among the first, I'll, personally I'll say the first, to show clearly, explicitly, the need for an internal revolution. Now, that's in the very name, Internal Macedonian Revolutionary Organization. But it wasn't always like that. For a lot of people in the early Macedonian Revolutionary Org, they may have called themselves internal, but their views were still in line with Bulgaria. They still not only accepted Bulgarian aid, but were actively, in a lot of cases, working to eventually unify with Bulgaria, to use Bulgarian support, to involve Bulgaria at every step of the turn. Gotze finally gave the definition what actually internal meant. He knew the liberation of Macedonia had to be internal. This is a quote by Gotze. The liberation of Macedonia lies in an internal uprising. Anyone who thinks differently about liberating Macedonia, he's lying to himself and he is lying to others. So you recognize this need. And I'll give you a quick example of uh, a case that happened in 1895. Basically, a hot-headed um, revolutionary um, in the eastern part of Macedonia by the name of Alexander Chakurov thought he had Russian support and Russian help, and he basically started a premature, albeit small, early uprising in the eastern portion of Macedonia, thinking the motherland of the Slavic people, Russia, would just come in with their Russian army, and just get rid of the Ottomans, and all would be well. Gotze was furious when he heard this. This is what he wrote in a letter. Now, there's a lot of punctuation here that you obviously can't see, but just imagine a lot of exclamation points and a lot of holes in the paper from Gotze. So this is Gotze. He's speaking sarcastically, obviously. Did his grace Chakurov believe his own words, what he said verbally in his letters to Gospodin Ivanov, saying, I'll raise an internal rebellion. And soon as the banner is unfurred, the Russia, oh, glorious Russia, will fly into Macedonia on the spot. And here where you are, we will become free. Is this what he thinks? Is this how we educated our rebels? If you feed people with such empty, empty hopes, then you must realize that even the most outstanding of the heroes will eventually fall into despair. For Gotze, relying on foreign aid and foreign intrusion was an opium. It was a drug. It gave false hope and made even the best of us, the most promising of us, become crippled. It rose us up and eventually made us all collapse. It was a house of cards. It needed to become internal. For Gotze, this meant producing our own weapons, producing our own ammo, bombs, supplies, financing. In the early 1900s, he contracted some Armenian bomb makers to start making bombs for the Macedonians in Macedonia, and he was there doing it himself. He rolled up, he rolled up his sleeves. He was earning a meager salary as a school teacher, not making much devoted all he had monetarily to the supplying of weapons. He'd rather come out of his own pocket than begrudgingly accept foreign aid, attach the end of a stick from the Bulgarians or from the Greeks. He would not have it. So that's the need for an internal rebellion. Gotz also rightfully stated, we need a moral rebellion, a moral revolution. And this is honestly where Gotz makes his biggest impact. Gotz knew we could get all the money in the world. We could get the best rifles, the best bombs. The Macedonian people are mentally enslaved. This is the result of 500 years of denationalization, of no progress being made. None of the comforts of a modern progressive society was afforded to the Macedonian people. He knew if they were not mentally ready for a revolution, a united people supporting themselves, supporting the cause at every turn, it would all be for naught. So this is what Gotze Delchev said about that. Ours is the moral revolution, the revolution of the mind, heart, and spirit of an enslaved people. And that is our greatest task. Do you hear that? It's not getting rifles. It's not getting ammo. It's not getting financing. He was doing this. He was in the middle of all this. For Gotze, the biggest single challenge was liberating the mastering people from their own mind from their own slumber, a 500 year old slumber. Others wanted Bulgaria as a savior, some Russia, some Serbia, some even Greece. 
what's it said? None of it will matter if you yourself are not liberated. So that is in really where Gotze is becoming a mythos, a legend. He considered the individual at the heart of the revolution. He went to the poor, the, the, the villagers, the peasants, the farmers. He looked at them like they were a million dollars because he saw that this was the first step to a collective revolution and the first meaning uh, towards the liberation of Macedonia. Now, I did talk about this in a previous talk, but I do see some people here that are obviously quite new, so I want to read this. This is from one of the most detailed biographies written by Gota Dolcev. It was paid for by the Bulgarian state, so read it with a pinch of salt, but I want to read this. I'm going to go slowly. Please absorb my words. This is, you're going to hear Gota Dolcev. You're going to feel his essence like you've never done before. A man you've never met, he'll come alive to you. I promise you. Okay. So this is how Gota is portrayed. Um, let me just actually pull it up here. It'll be a little bit easier. In his relations with his friends and he, that he already converted, Gotze was always warm and spontaneous. By meeting someone in the street, he'd invite him for a cup of coffee in some cafe frequented by a lot of Macedonians. He himself liked coffee, but even though he thought it was too sweet and strong, he sometimes ordered double the quantity, a little too much. He would also take out his cigarettes, offer them to his friends, and perhaps even light one himself. He's a cigarette holder and was a heavy smoker, a fact which he made no attempt to hide. He would be the first one to start talking while you gazed at him, delighting in him. And he will go straight to your very soul and touch you in your most sensitive chords. He would ask you how you were doing with such intimacy and such sympathy that you came to believe that he saw everything in your soul and reacted to you in exactly the same way that you were. And you would open your mouth. You couldn't help but trusting him. You couldn't help but telling him the things that you hid, even from yourself. And he would ask you about your relatives and acquaintances, as though he, too, was sharing your burden. Meekly, imperceptibly, he would uncover your soul. And afterwards, you would wonder how it even happened. And you would see that he participated in your experiences. And he was moved by them. He seemed to take you into his arms and into his soul. And after a few minutes, he would direct your feelings and emotions and your personal experiences. All who came into contact with Gotze Delchev felt something of his magic and his authority. Even his avowed enemies knew that he was a man of his word and a man he could be utterly relied upon, a man who was straightforward in his speech and in his actions, who never lied nor practiced deceit. He was a man who could enter, who could obviously enter the, the souls of ordinary mortals, enter any public building, and everything around them would stop and gaze at his own importance and his presence. How many people got goosebumps reading that and hearing that? I kind of teared up there just a moment. That's what Gotelchev was. Uncommonly kind, uncommonly passionate carrying the cross with every Macedonian that was there with him. You were in awe of his spirit, of his magic. You couldn't help but trusting him. It was infectious, affectious spirit that he had to him. So that's what I'm trying to get to you with Gotze Dolce. He not only imbued everything that was noble and pure in the Macedonian cause, but he gave form. He gave definition to our revolution. He didn't look at the nobility. He didn't look at the military. He started with the peasant, with the villager, and he made them feel like a million dollars, showing him what they too could be capable of if they just followed him. Absolutely remarkable. And finally, let's take a look at a wider view. Gotze, as you know, was very left-leaning a lot of his views. Best I could describe him was he was a cosmopolitan. He was almost socialist, but he was also very regional. As much as he wanted foreign um, collab, no, I shouldn't say collaboration, he wanted all the states of the Balkans eventually liberated and living in harmony as part of a wider Balkan federation. But he refused foreign aid. He said this was related to the ambition and to the political machinations of the person holding the end of the stick. He pointed out, this is a quote, 
the organization of the mastering people is necessary to overthrow slavery, not to simply trade back and forth. It was not a monetary transaction for him. So he did want Macedonia's revolution to be regional, to be local, to involve the Macedonian people. And while he was in Sofia, like I said, he was butting heads with the supremacists there, with the Macedonian supremacists, which by all intents and purposes were largely swallowing the Bulgarian pill. They were for a Bulgarian Macedonia. So this is my favorite episode of Gotze probably. Gotze is 24 at this time. Mind you, I'm 25. Gotze is 24. While there, he is um, uh, in contact with a Bulgarian military colonel about twice his age. And of course, with the Bulgarian cause at the time, they're trying to get Macedonians to open up to Bulgaria, open up their hearts to the Bulgarian liberator. And this is what a 24-year-old Gotze Vilchev <laughs> tells a military colonel twice his age in a letter, after uh, disagreeing with him, obviously. We do not agree with what you think of Macedonia. You know what I mean by we, the peasants, the Macedonian population, the people. We cannot play politics, nor allow others to do so in Macedonia. Our struggle here means life and death for us. We will not allow others to decide whether we should live or die and when. The people will decide when to rebel. We will not permit ourselves to be commanded from here, Bulgaria. To be bought into a game of rebellion, as you tried to do last year, we consider, we consider we should receive brotherly aid from you, from the committee and the emigrant groups. But you must understand, we don't want patrons, and even less, lords. We don't want this. So this is Gotze Vilchev at 24, speaking to a military colonel twice his age. Needless to say, he wasn't happy about this. You kind of see now. Why the Bulgarians, after his death, some of them said, oh, we're finally rid of that dog. He was a pebble in their shoe, no doubt about it. Gotze wanted spiritual purity in the revolutionary movement. He wanted it to not be contaminated. He was an idealist at the end of the day. Remember, his first and last time shooting a rifle was when he died. He was an idealist. He was a, a youthful innocence to him, even though he was effective at what he did. Like I said, he didn't see Turks as enemies. He didn't see any other non masterings as enemies. He was an opponent of the system. And to reach this desired goal, Gotze said, we have to increase the energy of everybody, to stretch it even to the dormant currents of the slave, to move his feelings to that of sacrifice, even the dormant slave. So in a sense, folks, Gotze Lochev was the man that finally lifted the curtain finally awoke Macedonia from its 500-year-old sleep. He saw, he felt the pulse of the masses better than anybody before, and he took their hand and he raised them from their sleep and said, this is the way. You're the first to do that. So here are my closing thoughts now, folks. I'm going to read this from uh, the book on Gotze Dolcev, the biography here. Um, and we are obviously going to close and we're open up some questions, but this is a direct um, quote from there. So I do want to read it. I think it's probably one of those beautiful things. So this is the paragraph I want to read. And the people remember it too, but less distinctly, enshrining their memories in symbols and a pleiad of chosen names. The heroes and martyrs are as stars of heaven, but all of them are remembered when people sing of Gotze Dolcev. And when people sing Gotze Dolcev, they're singing of the conscience and the soul of the entire movement, Gotze, who challenged the powers of darkness in the world and in men's minds, Gotze Dolchev, who against all odds persisted in his belief that love and mercy are stronger than terror and force will ever be, Gotze, for whom all men were brothers and nationality merely the difference between flowers and a garden. And just remember folks, we got to remember this episode in Gotze's life. When he came back to Macedonia, after coming from Bulgaria, he was exhausted. He was disillusioned by what he had seen. And Dami Gruev does ask him, why are you returning to Macedonia? There's, there's nothing here. And Gotze replies thus, why? Is there any other place for, Ma for a Macedonian other than Macedonia? Is there any field wider for work than in Macedonia? Well, folks, the field is out there, ladies and gentlemen. 
and it's a field of cultural competition amongst the nations, as Gota Delchev said. And that field, it's often messy and it's dangerous. It's filled with chauvinists and opportunists at every single step. But luckily, we're not in this alone. Our school teacher from Shtip still continues teaching his flock, his students, the ways towards the true Macedonian liberation if we but stop and listen to his words. The revolution and the hope for a better Macedonia rests in every single Macedonian. And Gota Dilchev knew this better than anybody. As Gota Dilchev said, it's no small thing to be a human being, never a small thing. And to that, I say, thank you, Professor. Myself and everyone watching tonight, we will always be your students and we will always carry the revolution of Gota Dilchev forward. With that, we await your next lesson, our dear teacher. So with that, folks, I do want to thank you for tonight. I'm going to switch over to my uh, headphones now, if you give me just a second, and we'll be in touch with our questions. So, um, <laughs> wow, Mario, like, you are the Macedonian history Wikipedia. I mean, you're full of facts, and, and the research that you've done is just stellar and impressive. And I, I want to, you know, a few questions from the audience, but one, I, I want to ask you. Please. I, what, what inspired you to really um, delve into Macedonian history the way you've done? Um, so that's question number one. Okay. Question number two from the audience is, was it Stalin's right man, Macedonian? Question number three, what uh, became of the right wing, Vamaro? Okay. And then question number four, you alluded to those portraits of Gotze and the others in church halls. Mm -hmm. uh, Jim Pavle, our advisory council member, vividly remembers uh, the St. Clement's um, uh, portraits and, and all that. Uh, was there one standard portrait image? And I just want to say here that we actually had um, one Gotze portrait in my household and literally all my parents friends and you know we, we we looked at him as as mario described as a mythical figure and you know growing up we really didn't know much besides they fought and died for an independent sovereign free macedonia so why don't we take those questions mario and then we'll go to the next round after all right mito uh first of all you have to remind me of those questions in between i'll do my best to remember them uh, my memory may be good, but um, <laughs> I'm kind of tired today. So first of all, folks, I do want to appreciate you um, giving me some questions. Obviously, I do want to do my best to answer them. Um, so the first question was, how did I get inspired for, um, you know, to fight for Macedonia and to research the way I did? I'll give you a little bit of a backstory. Um, my, let's see, my great-great-grandfather from my village died in Ilinden, in Sapari. Um, he is in the monument in the list of names. Um, so he did die. His name was uh, Stanko Katkarov. So I knew about this early on. Um, my great-grandfather, he was also a political prisoner um, in Goliotok. Um, he was also very masculine, uh, patriotic oriented. So I know about this. And on all sides of my family, I mean, we've always kind of been patriotic um, with our outlook to Macedonia. But moving to America, I was extremely ashamed to not be an American. Um, I was ashamed I didn't have a middle name. I was ashamed I didn't have an easy name to say. So I kind of hid that side to myself. And it wasn't until early middle or late high school, or, yeah, I would say early high school, I would say, that um, I started seeing the beauty of the individual aspect to my identity and I started researching. I um, watched the movie, I think it was actually 300 that I saw. And then I saw Alexander, and then I'm like, they're saying Macedonians, I kind of want to know more about this. Then I had the phase, like everybody else, I went to like the known resources, but growing up, I realized they weren't actually all that great and all that in-depth as I wanted them to be. And seeing all the preparedness of the Greeks and Bulgarians on our side, I mean, against us, I should say, um, that gave me more fuel because I started realizing, like I said, the way our history may be taught may not be accurate, but the truth is still on our side. I mean, that, that's a very weird thing to stomach, that you may hear things that are not comfortable for you, but they actually still prove what you're trying to defend. It's a weird, weird amalgamation there. 
So that's really kind of how I started. I do have a mentor as well. Um, I have a friend in Detroit, my name is Vasco Yovanovsky, who has also helped me. And I talk to people. I mean, I've gone to villages in Macedonia to talk to them about the, the rebels marching through to hear their stories. Um, they still remember it. And when they see kids, youth, talk about it, they open up like you never expect. And um, for me, I mean, my grandpa was my best friend growing up. And he was a very, very strong patriot. And growing up, we did bond over that more than anything where we had him before. So um, that's also a personal reason that I'm kind of pushing forward with this as well. Um, it is kind of, you know, honoring my family and honoring my legacy. So everybody has a different story, but um, you eventually come to life realizing when you're, you know, just a cog in the machinery and you're not standing out and you're not doing anything to honor your legacy. What are you doing? So I've heard that many times before. All right. What was the second question there? Um, your dado would be very proud of you. Um, Appreciate it. Question: that The second question is, wasn't Stalin's right man Macedonian? That's a very interesting question. Has anybody seen the movie Death of Stalin? Um, yes. Uh, his immediate successor was a man by the name of Georgi Malenkov. Technically speaking, yes, he was Macedonian. His parents were emigrates from Ohrid. Um, so he was ethnically Macedonian. But I give the test. There's a lot of people that were ethnically Macedonian that didn't think of themselves as Macedonians and didn't really advance Macedonia's cause. A man by the name of Alexander the Great was Macedonian, but he didn't do much for Macedonia. Georgi Malenkov, I'll put him in the same vein. He is probably the most powerful Macedonian in modern history by his descent, but didn't really do much for Macedonia, nor was he cognizant of his Macedonian identity apart from his origin there. So yes, he was Macedonian, does not dispute it. His ancestry was from Ohrid. Uh, third question. What became of the right wing, Vamaron? Also a good question. Um, I'm, I'm here to break it for you folks. It's not the, <laughs> the party in power today. Um, Vamaro is a historical relic of Macedonia. Um, even ideologically, I mean, they're not one and the same. The right wing Vamaro uh, definitely saw its rise during the early 30s. Um, they were out of the base of Pirin Macedonia, and uh, they were obviously more right-leaning towards the Bulgarian policy, but they essentially had a state within a state. They were running things. I mean, they had their own taxes, their own police in Pirin Macedonia, even though it was under Bulgaria. Eventually, there were attempts to reunify both left and right. We saw this with the May Manifesto. Obviously, that doesn't succeed, and there's splintering, obviously, starting to occur. Todor Alexandrov, while he was initially right-leaning, became open to the possibility of not just going that path, and he was killed for it. After he was killed by a man by the name of Vancho Mihailov, who, another Macedonian, but born in Shtip, took over, and this man was a fanatical pro-Bulgarian to the end of his life, said there's no such thing as a Macedonian people. This is a man that worked with fascists in Croatia, the allied with the Nazis in World War II, not somebody we should be particularly proud of. He ran it into a ground. Nobody was proud to be Vamoro at this stage. It's going to be a very controversial statement for a lot of people. But I'm telling you, after Todor Alexandrov, the right-wing Vamoro was eventually run to the ground by Vancho Mihailov and was officially outlawed and disbanded by the Bulgarian government. So it's in the ashes. Vamoro is a historical relic that should remain in the past. We can learn from its successes and from its many mistakes as well, but should be left as a historical relic. Thank you, Mario. Um, do we know who painted the portrait of Goetze, and was there one standard portrait image? That's a good question. Yes, yeah, so the portrait image I'm actually looking here as well was taken when Goetze was in Sofia in 1893. Um, I'm trying to, I'm actually going to pull up the name right now. That was the shop of, excuse me a second, I always... Vladikov, Alexander Vladikov. If you remember, Macedonians were um, almost overrunning Sofia at the time. I mean, they were, it was, they were quite literally in all the positions. They had, eventually, they had eventually taken the state captive to serve their interests as Macedonians. Lutzelochev had his portrait taken in the studio of a man named, by the name of Alexander Vladikov, who was from Kukush. For all the Bulgarianness of Gota, supposedly, he, of course, chose to go to his local Macedonian living in Sofia to have his portrait taken. And that is the image that does grace many uh, classrooms, uh, church halls, and in general, Macedonian diaspora. It happened in Sofia 
by a Macedonian. There's other pictures of him too. Um, there's a Facebook page called um, Aegean Macedonia, Aegeiska Macedonia, has a whole album with a lot of photos you may never have seen before. So definitely check it out, but that is the most famous. Thank you, Mario. Another question. I have heard many Macedonians claim that Goce Delcev was betrayed by Dame Gruyev. Is there any truth to this? It's hard to say. Um, I'm not going to, there's not, there's no direct evidence with this. But what is particularly suspicious of Dame Gruyev was during the um, Lilo Smilovo Congress, where they were deciding the fate of the revolution, whether it would happen or not. Um, he was uncommonly reserved. He didn't speak out against it. Normally he would have. And there's speculation that at this stage he may have been working with more Bulgarian interests than he cared to let on. Of course, he's still considered a hero in Macedonia, but let's just, you know, look at him like a real person. There's some controversy regarding his um, decisions there. So I'm not going to lay claims to that. I'm not going to sign my name off that. There is some controversy to Dame Gruev towards the end of Gotz's life. Most likely what happened, though, is you have to understand um, Macedonian peasants were poor and miserable. Um, they would betray each other left and right. The Ottoman Turks were surprised. They, were, they would say, you guys are the same faith, and yet you're killing each other and betraying each other more than you are Muslims. What is wrong with you? There's that old saying in Macedonian, and this is, I think, our death spell as a nation. If my neighbor, if my goat dies, I hope my neighbor's goat dies too. It's a lot of spite. It's a lot of envy. So if one part of Macedonia's village sees these community walking through, they have envy, they have hatred, they see opportunity, and they betray them. Most Macedonians were betrayed by other Macedonians. It's still happening today. Opportunism is a very noticeable cancer in our people. So could have been him? Yes. Most likely it was somebody in the surrounding villages. That's what I think. Thank you, Mario. We have two more questions. Please. These are gonna be the final ones. I'm gonna actually change the order um, because I'd like to end with one of the questions. Um, but first, uh, uh, there's a debate on the inventor, uh, John Vincent uh, Atanasov, um, who was the apparently the um, uh, best known for being credited with inventing the first electronic digital computer. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think he was Bulgarian or Macedonian? a very interesting question. I've, I've read about him. Let's look at it twofold. Are there Macedonians that are ethnically Macedonian, but have lived in Bulgaria their whole life, and ancestrally, they have eventually become Bulgarian? Yes, there are many like that. That's one of the tragedies of our people. Many Macedonians that would move to Bulgaria would eventually become Bulgarian. I mean, you're influenced by that propaganda 24 hours a day. It's easier to not go against the grain. We have entire, I mean, families of revolutionaries. One side that stayed in Macedonia, other side that went to Bulgaria, and now they're on competing ends. So that's the first thing you have to keep in mind. Second thing you have to keep in mind is, like I said, look at their deeds, look at their actions. Was he cognizant of Macedonian ancestry? I don't know. Even if he was, I don't think this was anything near and dear to him. There are many people we can claim as being ethnically Macedonian that it's an association by ancestry only. Another thing you have to keep in mind is, it be a very controversial statement, but the whole idea of a Bulgarian identity, it's very, it's very messy, very fluid, and very complex. What Bulgarian meant to the people living in Upper Bulgaria, the Mesian Bulgarians, is a very different thing than what it meant to the Macedonians that also at a time considered themselves Bulgarians. Completely different things. So it's a very messy identity. A lot of different racial groups and ethnicities have combined under this large umbrella called Bulgarian. So to that I say, even if he was, for all intents and purposes, it's not something to where we can claim him just because of association. That's, Greeks try to do that with everybody, it's not worth it. Thank you, um, and final question. Um, what do you think uh, we can learn from Gotze and apply to our lives today? Beautiful question. I see why you saved it for the end there. A couple of things, folks. Um, we have to be humble, we have to be gracious, we have to be patient. Gluzio looked at the peasant as he looked at, you know, a king or a military colonel. He saw the hope in each and every one of them. He didn't look down on them. He, and throughout his whole life, his biggest, I mean, he was actually from early 
uh, childhood, he was in a lot of pain. He had ulcers in the stomach. But what actually caused him the most pain uh, from that was seeing the division, the hatred, the, you know, splintering of all the groups in Macedonia against one another. So we have to be patient. We have to be calm. To look at each person as an individual, as a human. This is what Zilch just said. It's no small thing to be a human. And in many ways, Gotze was very idealistic. It's good and bad. We kind of do need a beautiful, youthful kind of take on how to liberate our people because Gotze understood it cannot be complicated. It cannot be, you know, poisoned with these outside external ideals. So stay humble, connect with your fellow man, work every degree of mind and spirit you have for Macedonia, if you can. Gotze didn't make much money. He had a meager existence. All he had, he devoted to the cause. And honestly, inspire the best within us. That's exactly what Gota Dilchev did for everybody. And that's why there's pictures of him everywhere. He inspired the best within us. Inspire the best in your fellow Macedonians. And that's the path forward. That's what Gota Dilchev died for. Thank you, Mario. Well, with that, we're going to turn it over to Kristina Dimitrievsky to conclude tonight's uh, virtual hour. Thank you so much, Mario. Um, knowledge is truly key uh, in the battle to educate the public about issues that matter to Macedonians. We can't forget our history as we look to the future, uniting Macedonians wherever they live, um, in Macedonia, in neighboring countries, or even abroad. Generation M, uh, UMD's Young Leaders Program, is making sure that young Macedonians have the necessary to tools to excel, uh, whether through the BTOF Scholarship Program, Birthright Macedonia, youth conferences, or the DC internship program. I can't wait for COVID-19 to be over so that we can continue doing in-person programming. Yesterday, we actually announced Generation M's expansion by adding members in Australia and Europe, including our first ever representative in Solun, um, as well as a senior advisor to the board. Please take some time when you can to uh, read their biographies on generationm.org. Through this expansion and the ongoing commitment of UMD Generation M members, Macedonians around the world will find a community that perseveres during an unprecedented period such as this, one that persists together. We encourage all young Macedonians to join the ranks of Generation M to continue the advancement of our culture and identity. If you've been enjoying our virtual events, please consider supporting UMD and its Young Leaders Program, Generation M, by donating via our links uh, on our websites or uh, on our, we our Facebook page, apologies. Um, on behalf of UMD and our Young Leaders Program, Generation M, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Stay safe and stay healthy. Good night here in North America and have a great day in Australia.